Ladies and gentlemen, you have a real treat coming up because the absolutely amazing Andy Kaufman, Francie Rawlings, Laszlo Gonk, Maria Mattarelli, Jennifer Tharp. You have to be able to see the big picture. You have to have kind of a systems mindset. We often don't think of those people. Like, who are those people that are going to impact us? You have to do something different than, than the average person if you want to be a leader, right? So hello, everybody. This is Kimi. And as you guys know, in the KSP Online Academy, we focus on all aspects of leadership. And so I was really excited because today our guest is someone who demonstrates leadership in any number of ways. Uh, Bill Gertine is known to a lot of people as but this is not a reflection on Bill himself, but he's known as the 800 pound gorilla of sales performance. And sales is one of those rare areas where people who are being led well don't actually think of themselves as being led. They think of themselves as being in a collaborative relationship. So I really thought that this would be a great time for you guys to hear from a leader in a different kind of professional capacity because Bill's trained people all over this continent from the U.S. to Canada to Mexico and there are over a hundred pro sports teams who use his expertise to help their sales stay robust. Now the thing is not only do they get to use his talents, thank you very much Bill, in terms of on platform, which is what we call it, as you know, when we're in front of people, but, and this is why I was so excited he was willing to do this, he's just launched recently an online version, and we're calling it, and I want to make sure and hit my notes so I, I say this absolutely correctly, the Inspiration Sports Business Institute. Did I get that right, Bill? Absolutely right, Kimi. Good job. Thanks. Okay. So, Bill, if we look at this, what do you think is most important when you're training sales franchises within a sports environment? Um, what is it that you find the most fascinating about doing this kind of thing? Well, and it's a great question to start with, Kimi, because it is one of the things that I get asked a lot. Because many of the sports teams that people would know and see or even be fans of think that the sports tickets sell themselves that they fill the stands with absolutely no advertising or no direct sales or proactive sales at all. And just that's magic. not the case. Yeah, uh, there magic. are as few as two or three or as many as 75 sales reps yeah. within a sports team, depending on the size of the club, the size of the market, and how good the team is. If you have a poor performance team, you need more people to be able to proactively sell those tickets. Yeah. But the, the underlying theme with all of the work that I do with these teams is to help them build relationships. And if it were easy as just the turning on the internet and selling tickets, there would be no relationship. And that's not the case. We as reps in sports and in any sort of environment must build the kinds of relationships that builds trust. And that builds a relationship with the team way beyond whatever the team is that's coming to town or the day of the week that the team is or with the poor performance or great performance of the team. There has to be an ongoing relationship with each of the season ticket members or anyone who comes to the team for that reason, not just season ticket members, to be able to sustain a relationship beyond wins and losses. And that's my expertise. That's what I help train. I think that's particularly important because let's face it, we're both in the Midwest and I often joke that my introduction to Midwest sports happened the year that, da-da, we won the World Series. And I have survived the uh, downtown experience during that celebration. <laughs> and thanks to those kinds of relationships that were built over decades, there were people whose grandparents had been big, big fans, and they were holding the hands of their toddlers. Now yeah. that's relationship building. It truly right? is. And it's not uncommon today to have this, but 20 years ago, that was a brand new, fresh concept for sports teams. In the Jordan era, in the early 90s, the Bulls were the very first ones to be able to incorporate a lot of database ag aggregation of, of all of this information coming into the relationship building process. They knew at that time that the Jordan years were not going to last forever. And so there were some very forward thinking people at that time that began 
compiling information about others and who they were and what they were all about, not just where they sat and how much money they spent, but what other sports they enjoyed, what they do for a living, what their oh. children enjoyed doing, what sports they were involved with, what college did they attend. Those are the kinds of things that became more important as Jordan's era faded and as did Jordan fade, so did the team. And so there needed to be a reason for people to come outside of the fact that they would see perhaps the greatest of all time. And so that became the relationship of building upon which now the Bulls uh, enjoy a, a very robust, even as the team is performing poorly, uh, they always enjoy top three in terms of attendance in all of the NBA year after year. And, you know, I find that fascinating because that speaks to a lot of how you have to be prepped. You have to be in the right mindset and have the right kind of attitude towards what you're doing when you pick up the phone or, you know, hit the button to start that conversation, which means that you've got all these kind of noises in your head, which leads me to my other question. I am fascinated by your new keynote speech. And I'm dying to hear, what do you think makes your keynote speech, which is fairly new, the seven voices in your head, what do you think makes your keynote speech different? Because a lot of people have tried to approach helping great big audiences almost on a one-on-one -on -one perspective, deal with their mindset when they're building those relationships. Yeah, I was inspired over the last several years when working with particularly young reps that come right out of school, are hired by the club, have never had a sales job before, and have wonderful skills and abilities, mm -hmm. but somehow fall short at the finish line when it comes to the, the tally after they've done the work. And many of the people who were hired are Division I athletes who did really well, or they were very brainy and, and got through school with high honors and had not been used to failing. And in our world, our average is 100 phone calls a day or 100 touches per day to people that are uh, mild to medium warm prospects. They may have been a single game ticket buyer in the past, or they may have had some sort of a profile that we've identified that may make them a good candidate for that. But they're not sold and, and they're not slam dunks by any means. And so people who have been very, very successful their whole lives are now thrust onto a telephone and are failing the majority of the day. In those 100 calls, we may have eight solid conversations, which may or may not result in one solid lead or sale. And so many of the days that someone starts, particularly their first 90 days, they'll go home without a sale. Yeah. And certainly drive home thinking, why in the world did I take this lousy stinking job? Because I'm, I was really good at whatever I was doing, and now I'm in this situation where I'm failing all day long. And the challenge that we have in our industry, and certainly in many others that you deal with, Kimi, is that there is failure that leads to success. And to have the courage to, to continue on, you really have to be able to be trustful of the process. And that's where I believe these voices get in your head, where the process is the correct one, but people begin to doubt it. And then you have these seeds that are planted of, of, of feeling as though you're failing and you're guilty of maybe not doing the right things or you feel badly about having dropped the ball on a particular call because you didn't have the right answer to an objection, like your team is no good or I live too far away, and, and you didn't have that right response and you hang up the phone and you say, oh, how could I have not said that the right way? And there's so I many people- I should have said. I should have <laughs> and said. they just give up too soon. And, what I, and, and so I watched this and have throughout my entire career in sports and created then, a model, a, a, a blueprint of seven different voices that I have seen in people's heads. And it doesn't have to be only sales reps. It's really a broad topic for the general public. Uh, the sports analogy has, has always been interesting to many people, but it's far broader than simply sports. And we don't get into the history of sports or wins and losses. We talk about ways in which to overcome some of those voices to achieve success. And, and we, I created the keynote very specifically because I didn't want to be like everyone else. I've done this for a long time. Uh, as you know, a member of the National Speakers Association for uh, well over 15 years now. And the current president of the local chapter here in Illinois. Thank Indeed. you very well, thank much, you. Mr. President. Uh, thank you. It, it, it's, it has always struck me though that keynote speaking was something I always wanted to aspire to do. As a trainer, 
you learn a lot from NSA about how to be a good trainer. But yeah. I've seen keynoters, I've seen the very best do what they do and think, gosh, what sort of message could I bring? And really never had that until this breakthrough that I had with regard to the seven voices. Over the last couple of years, I'd also seen in sports a larger propensity to talk about mental health and how important it is in the ongoing uh, saga of sports and how many people go undiagnosed because they don't wish to come forward. And there was an enormous movement now toward the fact that it really is okay to say you're not okay. And there have been two or three organizations that have actually sprung up to address that and to make it okay to, to step forward and say that you need help. And so as I created my keynote, I did not want it to be like everyone else. And so I chose specifically to not use any visuals in this. Many people who do keynotes have giant yeah. photos behind them and have <laughs> big, uh, phrases and uh, yeah. it becomes the focus. And what I chose to do is create one without any visuals. It has only audio pieces of, of voices. Mm -hmm. It has sound effects. It has music. And it actually finishes with a live performance of me singing along with the seven voices in harmony in the background where I'm actually playing piano at, live and actually, and they're singing with me you know, on the recording in the background. Oh my goodness. Now, this is something that is a reoccurring theme. And ladies and gentlemen, I've had the privilege of being able to work with Bill on a couple of things. So I'm going to speak here from experience. This is part of a reoccurring theme that I see where you work really, really hard to make sure that the people that you lead, um, and one of the aspects of your leadership is that you don't lead from the front of the table, you lead from the power of your integrity, which is a huge source of power that nobody will ever be able to take away from you as opposed to titles and things like that. Um, but you lead for, by establishing a trust level that gives people a zone of safety. And I think that is a huge part of what you're talking about there because nobody's going to be able to feel it's all right to say that things are not perfect unless they feel safe. And as a leader, that's really one of your responsibilities. But I, I was kind of wondering, how did you figure out that there had to be a balance between leadership as a hard thing and, and leadership as a nurturing aspect. Well, as all of us have gone, and it's a fabulous question, and it's one that's very, it's, there's not a simple solution to that. I believe that what, what has happened to me is that I've been fortunate enough to have some very, very good leaders that I've reported to in my career, that I've had a chance to watch. And I've also had a few clunkers, some people that I wouldn't necessarily be really proud to say that I worked for, but I also learned something from them along the way. I think it's important for us to realize that sometimes we have bosses that really teach us how not to be a certain leader, that you do not want to aspire to whatever they've done, but you would do something almost exactly the opposite yeah. that you'd seen. And so I think I've been fortunate enough to be exposed to about a dozen leaders throughout my career that have either expanded my notion of what I need to become mm -hmm. or have absolutely crystallized the fact that I do not want to be what they espoused. And so I think one of the things I've, I've really taken away from, from the, observing them is that those who lead well don't necessarily have their legacy on their wall. They have it in their people. And it's a, a phrase that I've used time and again is your legacy is in your people, not on your wall. And so it has to do more about what you achieve together than what you achieve individually. Many times in sales, that runs counter to what we tell people because as individual sales reps, we always try to strive to be number one or to be top of the leaderboard or to have this individual performance that shines. And what I have found is that many of the people who are number one on the leaderboard get there because of collaboration with many of the other customers that they have. They don't consider them as trophies on the wall. They consider them partners and collaborators in success. And those are the kinds of people that receive more referrals, they get more success upon success, reorders, and many other positives that come your way. And so it isn't always about winning the awards or being successful individually. It's all about making others feel very good about continuing to contribute to the whole. And I, I think that, you know, that there are two or three leaders that stand out in my mind that showed me that. And I can't take credit for it, but I was able to model 
what I had seen from others. And, and that's really the, the leader that I've become. No, I think that's important because that also means that there's always a demonstration of the kind of behavior that is desirable. It's not just the results. It's how you got to those results that's important, which brings me to kind of an interesting point. You work in an environment that, thanks to time zones and the globalization of everything, I mean, our guys play in the UK and in Mexico, for heaven's sakes. You're working in an industry that's 24 by 7, but you're not just Bill the 800-pound gorilla in sales, your performance. You're also Bill the president of NSA Illinois, Bill who's delivering and working with event teams to ease their lives and, and help them deliver an amazing event. You're also a dad, a husband, and a grandfather? Are you, are you really a grandfather? Number four could be any moment. Oh like, my goodness. Oh my goodness. So how do you fulfill all of those roles? I mean, how do you keep your head about you and a sense of balance and, and harmony in your life? Well, I, I have to credit my wife, first of all, for being very understanding in the career that I have. I think she's as excited about me working in sports as I am. And so oh. there's some pride factor that goes with that and also some responsibility of understanding that I need to be on the road a significant amount of time to do that. Yeah. And so as I've created this virtual company of training, mm -hmm. part of the reason I've done that is to be able to travel less so that I can spend more time here at home. I, I think we get into a, a pattern, a routine of what we do. And at first that was difficult and I didn't have the, the secret to getting it done. I just said, hey, honey, got to go back on the road, got to make some money, let's go. And she was gung-ho about the money part, certainly, but she just kind of swallowed and took it when it needed to, she needed to do things at home that I wasn't there. And frankly, there was a lot of guilt on my end that I was leaving a lot home that she had to do. And fortunately, uh, I was able to earn a pretty decent paycheck, and so I could justify a lot of it that way. She can't justify that 100% of the time and have a healthy marriage and a healthy relationship with your kids. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to where my children were older at that time. So we didn't have any infants or newborns at the house as, when I began to travel. And so my youngest was about, oh, would I say about seven at the time that I really started traveling full time. Uh, he's a junior in college now and the others have all grown up and have children of their own. But I think I started at a time where it was okay to travel a lot and not have an enormous burden here at home. But I would tell you that there are times in which I will refuse a job mm -hmm. based on the fact that I've been on the road too long and I need to be home for a few days. And I think it's the disciplining of that to be able to say, I need to parse my time accordingly. I can have some really focused work days and do really well at those, but then I need to, to set that aside and I need to be with my family. Uh, now, I, we, we joke sometimes that my wife enjoys, we, we enjoy our TV time. And so when we're together, we sometimes are hanging out, watching The Voice or whatever else happens to be on at the time. And I do have my laptop out. And so I'm doing the whole second <laughs> screen thing while we're watching this. And fortunately, she's okay with that. I, I think some relationships would have a difficulty with that, mm -hmm. but I can be present in several different places at once, mm -hmm. uh, but not focused on any one at any one time. And she's okay with that. And I've been able to be, I think, more productive as an entrepreneur in that sense because uh, she allows me that privilege and that freedom to do that. So I don't know that there's one secret to it other than making sure that you take time for each of them and be devoted to each of them when you're in those moments. I tend to agree. Sheryl Sandberg famously said that one of the most important partnerships decisions you will ever make is the person you choose for your life partner. It's mm -hmm. one of the most important decisions because it will inform, support, or destroy everything else that follows. And one of the things that I've noticed about the way that you conduct yourself is that you're, you're good at checking in with people and saying, okay, how's, how's it going? Is everything going okay? And you manage to do that without sounding like it's checking up on people as opposed to checking in on people. And I think that's probably really valuable. 
when we talk about balance though, there's also the public area of the sports industry and the private area of the sports industry. So you've worked on the inside with some amazing teams. You mentioned the Chicago Bulls and I understand you worked with my old home team, the San Francisco Giants. We're not gonna discuss the Texans, not really. Anyway, what is it about the message that you bring, because I know what I think makes it universal, but what is it about the message that you bring from that environment that can translate to those organizations that aren't in an industry that they think is even remotely related to that? Well, I think most people would be surprised to know that as big an organization as the Giants are in San Francisco or the Texans in Houston or any sports organization, they still have the same dysfunctions that you do. The okay. outward persona that you see on television is, is certainly not always indicative of what's going on inside. And so you have these walls that you know are kind of there. And it's not smoke and mirrors as much as it is image management. Yeah. There needs to be this feeling of, hey, we've got our act together, all is good, and we're selling out, we're doing wonderfully. And so PR firms and people that are in charge of that do a wonderful job of spin control. Uh, on occasion, things begin to leak out, and then you find out that it's not so rosy on the inside. There's some issues. There's turf wars, just like at your place. There's all kinds of stuff that goes on <laughs> that, that that doesn't have you know, any kind of, of playbook as to how to deal with it, just like in your place. And so you know, I think what they do a really good job of is the, the management of what they can control and to, to have others, under, for your sake, to know that they're not perfect either. And it may seem like, boy, just they must be just a fabulous place to work. They have to act together. They're always doing stuff. One of the biggest misnomers about working in baseball, for example, is that they take the whole winter off. You know, the sales department, you know, as if there's nothing else going on. It's like, oh, this must be great. You work in sports. Do you take off like teachers and just like go to, to Florida for the winter? <laughs> and no one has any idea what happens behind the scenes and the work that it takes to prepare for a season with yeah. group sales and, and coordinating the group's outings and things prior to the group actually happening in May and June. And all of the preparatory stuff that takes place, the repricing and the, the selling of the season tickets during the winter months and all of that prep is very, very time consuming. And, you know, someone may think, boy, it just looks so easy. They fill the whole stadium all the time and it, it, there are very, it, yeah. but there are very few people that do that without an enormous amount of lift behind the scenes. And I think more than anything else, what I've learned is that sports teams are like everybody else. They have their challenges, they have their issues, and they work it out. And there's a lot of hard work that goes into a sellout that no one will ever see sitting at home watching TV or even sitting in the stands watching the game. So you have actually brought up kind of an interesting point. We really do have this image of certain kinds of businesses are more glamorous than others. And so you're working in one that is pretty glamorous. And of course, you know, you manage to work with a number of different sports. So that means there's a round the clock, round the year kind of thing, but we only know part of the story you're working from an insider's perspective. And so you've given us a little bit of a taste of the process, et cetera, but peel back the curtain a little bit for us. What allows you to keep such a great level of enthusiasm about working with these folks? And so what a great question. Every team that I work with has such hidden potential with their people. And the groups that I like to work most with are the ones that are the biggest fans of the sport they represent. I, I just literally got home this week well, from that. a soccer conference where the league had gotten together and I, they asked me to speak to their league on sales to all of their sales reps and managers that were there. And one of the things we've been discussing was the fact that those who are really big fans have a very difficult time selling the team when they're performing badly. And um. what ends up happening is that the people who are not big fans who can be more objective about the team actually sell more and sell better over the long term than those who are fans because their fandom gets in the way. Oh, why? Oh. Fandom becomes a detriment 
There was one gentleman in particular who I will never forget. It was some years ago that went to the Miami Heat from another team because the Heat was really good. And he was very excited about the fact that he'd be representing a champion. Well, that happened to be the year that they went from first to practically worst. I mean, it, they won oh. the gold medal in the downhill that year. Oh my and, God. And so he, as a sales rep, was absolutely decimated, could not sell his way out of a paper bag because he felt as though there was no value in seeing a team that was playing that poorly. And what my oh. role has been is to train others about everything else that happens to someone when they come to a sporting event. Mm -hmm the team is lousy you still have the opportunity to connect with family and friends you still have the opportunity to be there for the exciting halftime performance and the pregame and the things that go on with that you still get to see the exciting plays of that day whether they're from the home team or the opposing team there's so many other things that happen as a result of an event and that's what we truly sell we don't sell sports we sell what happens to people as a result of a sporting event and win or lose those things are still going to happen and so the folks who are fans, uh, who truly believe it's the only reason to come to see a victory, are decimated when the team loses, as if there's no other value in the seats mm -hmm. than a seeing a victory. And so my role, in, and this is what I revel in, is to help them understand the broader picture, to see all of the good that comes from people, to people when they attend, and not just the negative of a loss. And sometimes that literally can be a, a 180 degree revelation to a fan who's been selling the seats and sees now why some others should be there. It's really fun to watch. It sounds like just like a lot of us who come to speaking because we care very deeply about how we can help folks in a particular area of our lives, it sounds like you have found that sweet spot where you help them see how they can also help other people. Yes, and to have that's really fun. How fun is that to show people that it's way beyond coming to see a win, but now it's helping a dad reconnect with his daughter right. who has, he only has every other week because of a divorce. Yeah. And she absolutely loves to come with him. And so it's the thing that the two of them share. Or it's a way for the family to all come together that, that with something they all agree on versus watching the little screen for five hours a day. Or some other thing with their church, with a group that has a senior pastor that really isn't fond of doing the traditional things to bring young people into the church. And you have a, a youth pastor who's really into this that sees the value of having a friend sort of event at a, a sporting event and having the church then grow from the children. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we do in sports. It builds community and it's not just what's going on. It's, it's the total experience, which mm -hmm. I think a lot of us have, have had a tendency to, to miss. So I know that you're an amazing speaker and you're a great trainer. Going from doing sessions where you're speaking and and workshops where you're training and coaching sessions to keynoting is a little bit different and you're amazing at it, but what was the actual audience that you felt you could reach better that no. was outside of the sports industry? Because this is, this is awfully evergreen in terms of applicability and leadership and safety and building relationships those are amazing but who specifically are you trying to reach i think there's not a single audience that couldn't benefit from the message i'm bringing but i will tell you that, that i the reason i created it and the audience that i had in mind were either young people or middle-aged transitional sorts of people who needed a, not a wake up call, but a recognition of the fact that they are more than what they have become and that there is something there inside that may be prohibiting them from the true success that they deserve. And I didn't, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, I don't solve, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a professional. If and you don't play one on TV. <laughs> but that was important to me. I did not want to come across as one who was pontificating and telling them that I knew the answers. That wasn't the, the, the reason for this. What I wanted to do was bring it to light in a way that would be entertaining, somewhat humorous perhaps, but very reflective 
and allow them maybe to see that it isn't just them, but and there may be something beyond what they've experienced so far that would cause them to say, hmm, are those voices maybe holding me back, one or more of them? And is there a way in which I can now address that? So I wanted it to be a starting point for conversation, either individually, internally, or with others, perhaps in a smaller group or a team, about the fact that there's far more within us that we can control, and perhaps some of those voices can be quieted in some ways they hadn't thought of. I think it's a very important teaching point that sometimes speakers who don't come from a training environment like you and I do, don't realize the power of helping people recognize, as you put it, what's going on, and at the same time, not coming off as pontificating because I've got alphabet soup behind my name and you don't, so there. Uh, but more acting as a walking, talking human reminder, if you will, that these are some things that you probably have thought about, but let's put it into a different context and a different perspective. And let's maybe shift it a little bit. You know, let's take it 15 degrees to this angle and then giving people the room and the time and the safety to consider doing something about it. So that is absolutely amazing. And in your audience situation, too, with those who are involved in the careers that they're in, they are actually needing to have some of this education background as well, understanding how people absorb information. Many times when you have a group that thinks they know everything they need to know about the topic you're talking about, you get the folded arms and the, you know, I, you know try and teach me something I already don't know. You, you know go yeah. ahead. Now, I'm bulletproof. I dare you. Or uh, I've actually had audiences bring newspapers. And open Are you up kidding? In protest of the fact that they are there. And it, it's, <laughs> it's a slightly disconcerting. <laughs> uh, that doesn't happen very often, but uh, you know, once or twice in my career, there have been some vehement protests uh, that have demonstrated in their own way that they have no interest in hearing what you have to say. The, the fascinating part of that is that as you do things, I believe that adult learning techniques involve surprising and delighting people in doing things in somewhat unorthodox ways. Yeah. So that throughout what I do, because many of my people that I work with the larger audiences that I have in my training business are in their early 20s to about 30. Ah. And these are people that have been perhaps through four years of college and certainly prior to that where if someone's been lecturing to them or they've watched <laughs> uh, online some things, but they, they just are not into, they don't want to lecture. Right. What they want is something that's unique. And so my mantra throughout my credit with, with, with training, and this is something perhaps your audience can use too, is bringing things to them that caused them to think, hmm, I wonder what's next. Yeah. To mix up the way in which you bring something to light that would cause them to say, wow, this wasn't what I was expecting. For example, there's a, there was a meme that was going around for a year, year and a half or so, and you may remember it, your audience may remember the Yanny versus Laurel. Oh, gosh. You recall this? Oh, gosh, yes. Okay. For those who have not heard it, you may want to YouTube this or whatever, but it, there was a, a study done at some university where a professor had taken the words Yanny and Laurel and put them together so that there was just one sound piece. And if you played it, some who heard it heard the word Yanny and some who heard it heard the word Laurel. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with the frequency and I don't remember exactly what the science was behind it, but I took that and I've used it as an opener for some of my toughest audiences. And so what we will do is we actually slow it down in 5% increments mm -hmm. and see if they hear something different when it's slowed down. And then we speed it up in 5% increments and see if they hear something different then. And so for those who were thinking, oh, this is gonna be a really boring training session, this is now something that's culturally relevant. They can actually say, hmm, this is kind of interesting. I remember having done this and I've had some of that experience. This is not what I was anticipating. And so what we do is, and it's important to have some relevance then to what you're training when you put something in there. And in this case, what we were talking about is, do you suppose that there's some people in sales, when you're talking to a prospect, you're saying all the right words and they're hearing the opposite word? So you may be oh. hearing investment, this awesome thing that you're going to have as an investment when you bring your, your organization out and all they're hearing is cost. 
where you're saying great time, you're gonna have a great time and all they're thinking is about your bad team. Yeah. And so we, we talk about the opposites of that. And so when they see the example first and they plug in this thing that is now relevant in their world, it's like the light bulbs go on and now you have their attention. And so the newspapers go down and whatever else they were doing, these things get turned off and then all of a sudden you have the room. And I think in some cases, there may be some of those in your audience that might be able to use a technique like that, as long as the element that happens at the end of it with the, the tie-in is actually relevant to what you're gonna be talking about. And communications is such an important thing that I think people get caught up in what I'm saying versus stopping and breathing for a moment and thinking, what are they hearing? Because there's so much conversation about how to craft your message. And yet, to your point, if we craft our message and we don't give thought to how the message is being received, uh, it turns out to be gibberish. There's a whole generation of us who actually refer to it as the Charlie Brown teacher thing. Bill. And there it is. There's no message whatsoever. Yeah, I think we as leaders get the mistaken notion that they want to hear our voice. And since we're in charge, that that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to lead and we're supposed to be the person in charge. One of the things that I have often done at the beginning of any sort of, of, of program that I do is I will ask myself, what does, what does this audience need to hear? from me to make them feel as though they can do what it is I'm going to ask them to do. Mm -hmm. And take myself out of the equation. How do I make them feel good about implementing that? I, at the end of a speech or at the end of a, a, a training session, I don't want my audience to say, boy, he was a great trainer. What I want them to say is, boy, he, I got a lot to work on. I've got a lot to think about. I've got a lot of brand new techniques I can use and make it more about them and the change that they will be affecting in their own lives rather than this amazing person at the front of the stage. I don't want that. In fact, I would prefer not to have that at all and have them feel as though I am almost making this happen as a, a facilitator rather than the teacher. And I think leaders could take a lesson from that as well, that it isn't just you telling them this is the way it's going to be, it's how do we collaborate on this and how do we make this your message so that you feel really good about now implementing what it is we just talked about. It's not just engagement and enrollment, which is a really popular phrase in some of the leadership material I've seen. And I always tell them that engagement and enrollment is a very nice way of saying, look, I want to have a conversation with you and I want to have an agreement with you. This is not about me telling you what must be but about me finding out from you how we can get things moving forward. And that's, that's an entirely different kind of perspective. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this message may be something that you're seeing because you understand the value of what we're talking about here. We're talking about building relationships and how leadership isn't just in project management or in executive roles. It's also in sales and it's also part of how you lead from what John Maxwell is pleased to refer to as the 360 degree theory of leadership. Because your ability to build relationships, to convey a message well and get the message that across that you intended, not just what the other person might or might not hear. These are all topics that are going to be probably fruitful for ages. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Even though we filmed this particular interview at the time that Bill was just introducing this amazing keynote, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be pretty popular. So if you have a chance, you might want to catch a listen to it. It'll probably get taped and there'll probably be snippets available. But in the meantime, Bill, I would really love to thank you. You've given my people and hopefully your audience a 
a much deeper sense of why this is so important to both of us in terms of communicating these kinds of messages. But I also wanted to thank you because as one of the leaders that I am very honored to follow, um, it's been a delight to have you here for the interview. Is there anything, if you had to have one last thing that you would ask our joint audience to think about, what would that be? Well, I think as you move forward and as you become better leaders and better communicators is to think about what it is they need to hear from you at any given time. And it isn't all about your ego. Please put your ego at the door. It, yes, you're the boss. Yes, you have the title. But it, you're really more in charge of helping them achieve what they wish to achieve. And to, to, together, you will achieve far more than you individually could. And I hope this message today has given you some of that encouragement. I do have a website up now for this, the keynote. And so if there's interest, there will be snippets That's of it at the time that you may be watching this uh, because it has been videotaped and we're ready to go with that. So it is at uh, www.the7voices, T-H-E number seven voices.com. And so you're welcome to check that out. And, and I'm happy to accept any correspondence someone might have with a follow-up question or two from that site. Terrific. And by the way, we'll probably put uh, that link also on leadershipdrivenprojectmanagement.com so that you can, it can be affiliated with it. And of course, it shows up at the end of this video in the screen for contact information for Bill. Bill, thanks again very much for your time today and for coming up with such a great way of framing a message of not just relationship, but hope and encouragement for further growth because, well, the young folks aren't the only ones who have the room for growth. Even people at my ancient age could do it. And I think that the way you're delivering it is amazing. So thank you very much for it's being here. It's been my honor, Kimi. Thank you so much for having me. Take care.